During my 44 years as a CEO and a serial entrepreneur, I've made every possible mistake in business. I've overpaid for acquisitions and botched integrations. I've run operations for cash when I should have invested for growth. I've delegated tasks I should have done myself. I've hired the wrong people. I've made strategic bets that didn't pay off. And yet, my teams and I have managed to create tens of billions of dollars of value for our shareholders. This book is about what I've learned from my blunders and how you can replicate our successes. I'm what's called a moneymaker. I've started five companies from scratch, seven if you include two spinoffs, and turned them all into billion dollar or multi-billion dollar enterprises. My teams and I have completed approximately 500 acquisitions. In total, these ventures have created hundreds of thousands of jobs and raised about $30 billion in outside capital. My career began in 1979 when I started a privately owned oil brokerage company called Amorex Oil Associates. I was 23 with just a few thousand bucks and no experience. Within four years, my partners and I had $4.7 billion in annual brokerage volume with offices worldwide. We sold Amrex in 1983, and I moved from New York to London to start an oil trading company called Hamilton Resources. Hamilton generated about a billion dollars a year in revenue, and we made this money through an opportunistic combination of crude oil trading, counter trade, pre-finance, and refinery processing deals. In 1989, so six years later, I moved back to the United States and entered a new sector, the rapidly expanding field of solid waste management. I called my new venture United Waste Systems and took it public in 1992. So founded the company in 1989, takes it public in 92, is going to sell it in 97. We became the industry's fifth largest player. And in 1997, we sold United Waste for $2.5 billion. United Waste taught me that I love working with outrageously talented people to deliver outsized returns for shareholders in public stock markets. So he sells United Waste in 1997. That same year, he says, I started a new company, United Rentals, to rent construction equipment for job sites. I took this venture public later that same year with a growth strategy that emphasized acquisitions from the start. Within 13 months, we had built the largest equipment rental company in the world. There's a hilarious story later in the book uh, about a lunch that Brad had with the CEO of the, his major competitor in that industry. Uh, I'll get to it later on in the episode. Within 13 months, we had built the largest equipment rental company in the world. United Rental Stock is a hundred bagger. The share price at inception was $3.50, and it now trades at more than a hundred times that price. In 2011, I was on to my next big thing, XPO Logistics. XPO was the seventh best performing stock in the Fortune 500 of the last decade. Its main focus was freight transportation, matching truckers with shippers, forwarding freight, and expediting urgent shipments. We built XPO into an integrated global logistics leader. I divided XPO into three separate publicly traded companies as a value creation strategy. We spun off GXO, the largest contract logistics provider in the world, and RXO, a freight brokerage platform that runs on technology that we developed in-house. I currently chair all three companies and each business is helmed by a strong CEO. These experiences have allowed me to share thought experiments that can help you learn to think differently, which is an essential prerequisite to accomplishing big things. This book is a guide. If you have a burning passion to make enormous amounts of money in business or want to turbocharge your chances of success in sports, the arts, politics, philanthropy, or any part of your life, read on. That was an excerpt from the book that I'm going to talk to you about today, which is How to Make a Few Billion Dollars, and it was written by Brad Jacobs. In addition to starting seven separate billion-dollar companies, Brad also listens to founders. He sent me a very nice message saying that he was addicted to listening to these book reviews. And he was kind enough to send me an early copy of this book a few months ago. And I read it and wanted to re to make an episode or to release the episode rather uh, when it's available so you can actually order it, which I highly recommend that you do. And you, that'll be obvious as we go through some of the ideas contained in Brad's book. So I want to jump right into it. He says, I've come to know a lot of extremely successful people in my life. They all have one thing in common. They think differently than most people. 
all of them, to a person, have rearranged their brains to prevail at achieving big goals in turbulent environments where conventional thinking often fails. I want to read one more sentence, and I'm going to read to you this quote from Peter Thiel that popped in my mind when I got to this section of the book. I love that, what he said. All of them to a person have rearranged their brains to prevail at achieving big goals in turbulent environments where conventional thinking often fails. Making a few billion dollars doesn't just happen, but it's possible with intense focus and a willingness to transform how you use your mind. That is the first chapter. So I got to this section immediately when I read that, the, the, one of my favorite quotes from Peter Thiel popped into my mind. And Peter said, the single most powerful pattern that I have noticed is that successful people find value in unexpected places. And they do this by thinking about business from first principles instead of formulas. That idea of finding value in unexpected places and thinking from first principles instead of formulas, uh, instead of using conventional thinking. Remember that uh, later on, we're going to talk about this outrageous thing that happened. Brad winds up making about $4 billion, buying back a bunch of his stock, even though bankers and advisors around him were saying, hey, no one's ever done something like this before. And his response was perfect because you could tell he was thinking from first principles. He's like, well, just because we were the first company to buy back such a high percentage of our stock in this situation doesn't mean it's a bad idea. And it turned out to be a phenomenal idea. So I like that he starts the book with this, where it's like you need to rearrange your brain to prevail at achieving big goals in turbulent environments where conventional thinking often fails. If Brad had, or another way to think about that in this situation, which we'll cover later, if Brad had listened and adhered to conventional thinking, he'd be four billion, him and his company would be four billion dollars poor. And so spread throughout the book, you're going to see these like boxed standalone maxims or pieces of advice that relate to what he's currently trying to teach us. And they really like the way I think about him is he's distilling down his knowledge from uh, into like simple to remember maxims. And so he says, so much of success in business comes from keeping your head in a good place. He talks about expecting the importance of expecting positive outcomes. And I think it says a lot that the first chapter of this book is called How to Rearrange Your Brain. And he spends a lot of time on the importance of managing your mind and attitude. Entrepreneurship is difficult and stressful, requires sound judgment, and you cannot make high quality decisions if you don't manage your inner monologue, your inner feelings. And I love this idea of expecting positive outcomes. Expect positive outcomes. Stop beating yourself up mentally. I have. The next time you catastrophize something that isn't that bad, understand that your reaction is a genetic survival trait that you inherited from your hunter-gatherer ancestors. The only time that I've ever felt truly lost was when I stepped down from United Rentals in 2007. So he's going to talk about, this is really, this entire section is why understanding and controlling your mind is so important for founders. And you and I have talked about this before. There's a great uh, quote by Mark Andreessen that said, entrepreneurs only ever experience uh, two emotions, euphoria and terror, and nothing in between. It's the highest highs and the lowest lows. So you've got to learn to control your, your mindset and your emotions. The only time I felt truly lost was when I stepped down from United Rentals in 2007. I started looking for my next big thing and I couldn't find it. I became depressed. I'm an ambitious person by nature and a deal maker by inclination. Now I had no deal going, no industry sector where I could envision working my magic. And so he starts reading like a library of psychology books trying to figure out how to fix this. He says, I learned to turn my internal chatter to my advantage by reframing negative thoughts as useful data, as useful data rather than objective reality. That is tied to another idea that he's going to use over and over again, something you and I have talked about over and over. Uh, it comes from this fantastic quote from this legendary founder named Henry Kaiser, uh, who was building companies around World War II. I read his biography because Charlie Munger recommended it to me. And actually, when I went to Charlie Munger's house to have dinner with him, uh, the book was sitting behind Charlie on the shelf, and I actually got to, to ask him about it. And it was incredible. Charlie hadn't read that book probably in like 15 years, but his recall, like he could, he, it was impeccable. Like told me, like essentially recited all of the facts that were in that book as if he had read it yesterday. But Henry Kaiser has this great quote in that biography. Uh, that says problems are just opportunities in work clothes. And so I think it's a similar analogy to what he's saying here. It's like, yeah, everybody's going to have negative internal chatter in your mind. Why don't we reframe that, use those negative thoughts as useful data rather than as objective reality? Back to Brad. Inevitably, the process of running a business will test your bias towards hope or fear, euphoria or terror is the way you and I talk about this. When I notice I'm feeling anxious about something, I ask, this is fantastic. I ask, what's the worst that can happen and how would I cope with it? 
And then he has another question he asks himself. If a friend had a similar worry, how would I advise them to handle it? So this idea of stepping outside of yourself, something I've tried to practice as well. Step outside of yourself. It's your problem. Pretend it's somebody else's problem, a friend, a loved one, uh, even a competitor maybe. And so, okay, if I had that similar worry or the similar problem, uh, problem and it wasn't me, how would I tell them to solve it and then just take your own advice? So he's saying putting distance between yourself personally and the source of your anxiety actually helps you uh, think more objectively about positive outcomes. This idea, like, think about it. Yeah. The guy has started seven separate billion dollar companies. And his the, the first chapter of the book is all about the importance of managing your mind and attitude. So he says, not beating myself up has been a hard learned lesson for me. I've become much happier in my middle age when I stop expecting unrealistic levels of perfection for myself and my family. I still struggle with this all the time. I beat myself up. I have a very, I always say my inner monologue sounds a lot like David Goggins. If you ever heard his uh, audiobook, Can't Hurt Me, that's what mine sounds like. So I'm going to have to take Brad's advice here. I've become much happier in middle age when I stopped expecting unrealistic levels of perfection for myself and my family, my friends, and my coworkers, not to mention customers, vendors, and shareholders. Uh, the reality is that when you're trying to make a few billion dollars, your team is likely running in multiple directions at a fast pace, except that some goof-ups are inevitable, and you'll find that it's much easier to maintain your mental equilibrium as you pursue big goals. This goes over several pages. I try to summarize this for myself so I can remember in the future. Don't beat yourself up. Emotions blur judgment. Keep a positive mental attitude and stay calm. And one way that Brad does all of that is he's a big fan of thought experiments. The reason, you, I mean, you're just, I think it's a no-brainer to, to buy the book. But there's a bunch of stuff uh, that I'm not going to cover in the podcast that's in here. Uh, that the appendix, I think of this as, what I would do is like I'd read it straight through. And then I'd keep it on a shelf or keep it on your desk and then use it as a reference. And you'll go back and there's a bunch of things. Like all the chapters are separate things. So like how to run great meetings, uh, how to do a lot of uh, M&A without imploding your company, how to build an outrageously talented team. I really do think this is a fantastic reference that should stay close um, at hand. And so one of the things he has in this book is a bunch of thought experiments that he uses. So I just want to outline why those things are so important to him. He says, Albert Einstein was a consummate daydreamer. And then he preferred the term, uh, it's German, I'm not even going <laughs> to try to pronounce it. But it's, it's daydreaming, thought experiments. So he says, thought experiments are not limited to genius scientists. Gifted artists, composers, composers, mathematicians all use them for creative work or problem solving. I usually spend about half an hour a day meditating. Much of this time is spent in thought experiments. This uh, produces a profound sense of calmness and is when many of my best decisions materialize. I, don't, I can't remember if I've already said this, but Brad was kind enough to invite me to uh, the book launch party they had in New York. I flew up uh, to New York just for like 16 hours just to go to the book launch and, and meet Brad. Um, what was fascinating, and I had this inclination, is like he's just got great energy. Uh, he's got great, I hate to say, I have no other way to say this. It's just a great personal vibe when you're like in person with him. And I talked to people that worked for him. They said the same thing. They like love him. They enjoy like the work environment that he's created. And the best source I know to experience like how Brad is, is I would listen to uh, the Invest Like the Best episode that Brad did with my friend Patrick. It's episode 352 of Invest Like the Best. And Brad in that interview talks a lot about the importance of meditating. He's been meditating, I think, for over 50 years. And as he says right here in the book, he, he feels it's been a, a, a huge benefit uh, to his career because that's where he feels many of his best decisions actually materialize. So let's go to this, what I mentioned earlier, that business is problems. This comes up over and over again, that business is problems and great companies, the way I think about it is great companies are just effective problem solving machines. And I first heard that idea or that idea was planted into my mind maybe seven years ago when I read Danny Meyer, the famous, famous restaurateur, his autobiography. And Brad's going to talk about his most important business mentor and the lesson that he taught Brad when Brad was in his 20s. I've had multiple business mentors over the years, but none have been more important than Ludwig Jesselson. Mr. Jesselson ran the largest commodity trading company in the world. I got to know him in my 20s when his company was a client of my oil brokerage business. Uh, before long, we were having lunch regularly, and he would share bits of business wisdom that have stayed with me ever since. At one memorable lunch, I arrived burdened. Remember, Brad's in his 20s at this point, okay? At uh, one lunch, I arrived burdened 
with problems that I began to unload on him. Mr. Justelson listened carefully and waited until I had finished speaking. Then he put down his fork, turned to me, and said, Look, Brad, if you want to make money in the business world, you need to get used to problems because that's what business is. It's actually about finding problems, embracing, and even enjoying them because each problem is an opportunity to remove an obstacle and get closer to success. I'm going to put this book down and I'm going to go to where I have my highlights stored from Danny Meyer's book, which is called Setting the Table. It's in, if you have access to Founders Notes, I highly recommend going, searching for Setting the Table and then listen, and then reading all of them. It takes less than 10 minutes and it gives you a good overview or a reminder of the lessons that Danny Meyer was trying to teach you and I from his book. But he had this a very similar experience. I'm pretty sure he was in his 20s at the time as well. He's having dinner with another older, more successful entrepreneur at the time, this guy named Stanley Marcus of the Neiman Marcus family. And it's remarkable. It's very almost dead on with what's happening with Brad in his, when he was in his 20s when he's talking to Mr. Jesselson. And so Danny Meyer is kind of unloading his problems and his stresses to an older, wiser entrepreneur. He says, opening this new restaurant might be the worst mistake I've ever made. Stanley set his martini down, looked me in the eye and said, so you, this is one of my favorite quotes I've ever read in any book. So you made a mistake. You need to understand something important and listen to me carefully. The road to success is paved with mistakes well handled. His words remain with me through the night. I repeated them over and over to myself, and it led to a turning point in the way I approached business. Stanley's lesson reminded me of something my grandfather, Irving Harris, who was a famous, or not famous, a successful entrepreneur as well. Uh, Stanley's lesson reminded me of something my grandfather, Irving Harris, had always told me. The definition of business is problems. That's exactly what Mr. Jesselson is telling a young Brad Jacobs. The definition of business is problems. His philosophy came down to a simple, uh, to a simple fact of business life. Success lies not in the elimination of problems, but in the art of creative, profitable problem solving. That's an excellent line, too. Success lies not in the elimination of problems, but in the art of creative, profitable problem solving. The best companies are those that distinguish themselves by solving problems most effectively. The way the maximum I distilled that down so I could remember myself is that business is problems and great companies are just effective problem solving machines. As we're going to see, we'll continue on this page. They get a lot of the best entrepreneurs, they would get excited. They would get excited when they found businesses or uh, problems in their businesses. And so Brad continues what he learned from this lunch uh, with Mr. Jesselson. In that moment, I learned something invaluable. Problems are an asset, not something to avoid, but something to run towards. Big ambitions, that's so excellent. Not something to avoid, but something to run towards. You know what? Let me interrupt. Let me interrupt where I'm at. Because when, when I got to this part, again, just popped right to my mind. I wrote down Jeff Bezos, Henry Kaiser. I already told you Henry Kaiser loved problems. He said problems are just opportunities and work clothes. Jeff Bezos, multiple books. In the Everything Store, the first biography of Jeff Bezos written by Brad Stone. There's, there's this interaction between one of one of Jeff and one of his um one of his employees. And he tells him like some bad news, something that like they need to improve on or whatever. And he goes, I brought him very bad news about our business. And for some reason he got excited. Is that not exactly what Brad Jacobs is saying? Problems are an asset, not something to avoid, but something to run towards. Later on in I think this was in Jeff's, uh, one of Jeff Bezos' shareholder letters, but he said that he finds waste uh, very exciting. So he says, uh, the customer experience path that we've chosen requires us to have an efficient cost structure. This is Jeff Bezos writing, by the way. The good news for shareholders is that we see much opportunity for improvement in that regard. Everywhere we look, we find what experienced Japanese manufacturers would call muda, uh, translates into waste. What experienced manufacturers would call waste. I find this incredibly energizing. I see it as potential years and years of variable and fixed productivity gains and more efficient, higher velocity and more flexible capital expenditures. That is from the book Invent and Wander. Uh, highly recommend. I've done, I think, two podcasts on that already. Uh, it's Jeff Bezos, all Jeff Bezos' shareholder letters and then transcripts of like his best speeches, but I love, I reference that book all the time. It's exactly what Jeff is talking about there. He's like, oh, I get excited. Ooh, this is waste. Good. This is incredibly energizing. It's potential years and years and years of improvements in our business. Very similar to what, Je uh, to what Brad Jacobs is telling us here. Uh, big ambitions often beget even bigger problems. If your initial reaction to a major setback is overwhelming frustration, that is counterproductive. 
Instead, do this. Great. This is an opportunity for me to create a lot of value. Is that not the exact same idea that Bezos just told us in his shareholder letters? It's the, exact, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same. Great. This is an opportunity for me to create a lot of value. If you can figure out how to solve this problem, I'll, if I, excuse me, if I can figure out how to solve this problem, I'll be much closer to my goal. In the four decades since that lunch with Mr. Justison, I've dealt with nearly every problem you can imagine. Challenges with acquisitions, people, tech, branding, you name it. I am not surprised when things don't go perfectly. That's the nature of this universe. The big, gunky problems can be where the best opportunities lie. This reminded me of uh, when I got to, to, to talk to Charlie Munger. He said the same thing. And it's, you notice this um, in his last, I think the last published interview he, ever, he did, or one of the last ones was with John Collison. Uh, the founder of Stripe interviewed him. It's actually published on the best, like the best feed too. It's also obvious, like uh, after spending a few hours talking to him, when I got back to my hotel that night, I, I had like this, I immediately just put all, like everything we talked about. Cause I didn't look at my phone one time when I was with them. I was like, man, this is a once in a lifetime experience. I need to, I, I want to document this. I want to remember this. And one of the things that I wrote was that Charlie had a complete, almost a complete indifference to problems. He said they should be expected. You should toughen up. Like you just essentially suck up and cope when you have problems that come your way. And then you should be wise enough to try to prevent any any other problems. Uh, but this idea, it's like very similar to what he's saying. I'm not surprised when things don't go perfectly. It's impossible. He's been a CEO and entrepreneur for 44 years. You don't think he's run into every single problem? Like, of course, that's what makes the, the book so valuable. I think I saw it selling for like $27. <laughs> that's absurd. That's an absurd amount of value that you get. You get almost half a century of wisdom distilled down at his book launch party he said this he's like i don't have another book in me like, i'm not writing another book i gave you all my ideas get buy it if you want it <laughs> and uh but i just think it's 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 uh incredible how you know everything i'm talking to you about this is three four pages and we see similarities in the way brad thinks that danny meyer thought that the guy from neiman marcus thought that jeff bezos thought that henry kaiser thought um that charlie munger thought i just love uh it excites me when all these ideas um, connect. Very, very fascinating. Moving on. This is great. He's got these great stories spread throughout the book. And uh, <laughs> uh, it, this is how to lose $500 million. So I want to go back, actually, before I get into how to lose $500 million, he's got a very unique uh, acknowledgement segment se section. I, I read, I have to confess that I read a lot of the acknowledgement sections in the books that I read. They're usually boring and like kind of like filler. Every once in a while, you'll find like an interesting source or an interesting book or something. Brad, what Brad did was put it at the front of the book, which is unusual. And then what he did is like, I, he just made his acknowledgement section a list of maxims that he learned from other people. You have all these conversations and you distill down one of the main ideas. And it's like, he learned this from Michael Moritz. Small amounts of capital can generate gigantic returns. Uh, from Ludwig Jesselson, who we just talked, get the major trend right, which we'll go into. Uh, you know, dare to do new things. See the world for what it is, not what you wish it to be, is one of the maxims in the acknowledgement section. I'm glad I read that before I got to this story about how to lose $500 million because see the world for what it is and not what you wish it to be is exactly what Brad did. And so he says, he calls this radical acceptance. Radical acceptance quiets the noise created by yesterday's decisions and today's wishful thinking. Here's a story about radically accepting a $500 million loss. So in the late 1990s, Congress came up with this new law called the T21, tra so it's the Transportation Equity Act for the 21st century. In theory, this is what Brad thought was going to happen. This legislation was going to allocate about $600 billion to rebuild the nation's infrastructure. So I was like, okay, there's going to be a bunch of all this funding up for grabs. I started scooping up big uh, road rental companies, the ones that provide barricades, cones, striping, and the like. Then I waited for the market to come to me, but that never happened. Only about a third of the allocated government funding was spent, and that was spent in little bits over time. My decision turned out to be a huge mistake, and there was no point in compounding it. We ended up selling those road rental companies at about a half a billion dollar loss because it was the best way forward under those circumstances. So this idea of see the world for what it is, not you, not what you want, wish it to be. He, he, he's like, oh, this is going to be great. They're going to spend out, uh, dole out the six hundred billion dollars. When that didn't happen, he didn't hold on to it. What does he call? Uh, radical exception quiets the noise created by yesterday's decisions and today's wishful thinking. No reason to compound this loss. Let's cut our losses and move on. The next story I want to tell you about is how to keep your head and make four billion dollars. This is my 
that was my summary of what's about to happen. So he at the time, he's running XPO, which is his third public company. And I think this is in 2018. And they got hit with a short report. And so this short report gets picked up by the media saying there's all kinds of problems with XPO. You know, you should sell the stock, everything else. And so this is the story from Brad. The short report was packed with a lot of baloney. But of course, the market acted first and analyzed later. And our stock price went into freefall down 20% or 26% in one day. His response was fascinating. We did exactly what I've been describing in this chapter. We concentrated on the situation at hand without judging what had happened to us. We spent hours going over the short report page by page, identifying the many places where their data had been twisted. And so he takes a problem and he spots an opportunity, which is what he's been talking about, right? The short seller crisis had made our stock extremely cheap. And instead of fixating on that as bad, we focus on achieving a good outcome. From that perspective, the share price was mana from heaven. And we decided to buy back $2 billion worth of stock. So this is what I mentioned earlier, where the bankers are like, $2 billion, it's way too high. You can't do that. That's too high of a percentage of your market cap. No one's ever done something like that. And Brad's like, who cares? Just because we were the first company to buy back such a high percentage of our stock. Remember, it goes from the opening. It's like you have to, th you can't rest on conventional wisdom is the way Brad put it. You have to rearrange your brain. The way Peter Thiel says is, hey, you should, you, successful people find value in unexpected places and they do so by thinking about business from first principles instead of formulas. There is no formula for the situation that Brad's dealing with. Or if there was, it'd be like, oh, buy you know a little bit, buy like 100 million back, but you can't buy $2 billion. What are you, nuts? Just because we were the first company to buy back such a high percent of our stock in a similar situation didn't mean it was a bad idea. In fact, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. A couple of years later, those $2 billion of shares we brought back, we bought back, ended up being worth $6 billion, giving them a profit on that one transaction of $4 billion. Okay, moving on. What this, is, this might be my favorite section in the entire book. Uh, I love how he describes all the research he does before he jumps into an industry, and it's this idea that he gets. He said, one of the most valuable pieces of advice I've received from my mentor, uh, Mr. Jesselson, is you can mess up a lot of things in business and still do well as long as you get the big trend right. I make sure I understand the major trends that could threaten the business or help it soar. I'm obsessive when learning about an industry. This this part, this entire, I'd read the entire chapter. Uh, I'm going to go over uh, the parts that are obviously most interesting to me. But it's a, it's another illustration of this idea that you and I speak about over and over again. You see it in the books. And it came, came from David Ogilvy. And he says, the good ones know more. They just do more research. They read more. They talk to more people. They just know more about what they're doing. The good ones know more. Um, and so his idea is like one of the main theme, themes that the mega trend uh, is that technology is the, the dominant mega, mega trend in our universe. If you want to make a lot of money in almost any, any industry, plan to invest heavily in tech. And that idea is as true today as it was a couple hundred years ago. Uh, I remember reading Andrew Carnegie's autobiography, uh, you know, many years ago, I don't know, maybe four years ago. And he's talking about building businesses in the 1800s. And he was talking about building Carnegie Steel at the time. And I had summarized the, the advice he was giving in that book uh, specifically around technology as this, and this, this comes up in the books a lot, invest in technology, the savings compound, it gives you an advantage over slowing moving competitors and can be the difference between a profit and a loss. That is from, that, that, that's a summary of Andrew Carnegie's ideas, which I think Brad, uh, based on this chapter, would definitely agree with. If you want to make a lot of money in almost any industry, plan to invest heavily in tech. So this is how he starts doing research before he starts a new company. I start by reading everything I can get my hands on. Journals, periodicals, newspapers, trade publications, employee reviews on web-based recruiting sites, you name it. I look, up, I look at all the websites and social media of the major players and the up-and-comers in the industry. I watch lots of interviews with the CEOs. I use paid services like Bloomberg, AlphaSense, and Thomas Reuters. Uh, I look at analysis from sell-side and buy-side analysts. And I search the SEC database uh, which has large amounts of information on every publicly traded U.S. company, including IPO documents, financial reports, and proxies. I scope out the most valuable industry conferences, and I attend them. He goes to sell-side conferences because they're an opportunity to meet management teams face-to-face -face and hear the questions investors are asking. Trade associations have a wealth of industry data. I interview experts. Uh, I seek out people who live and breathe the industry that I'm considering. This phase of the research is about getting face-to-face -face and listening intently. I love 
talking to CEOs. In addition to CEOs, I seek out investment bankers who are most active in the industry and who know it deeply. Just look at how much work and how much information uh, is collected, right? He, this is, it keeps going. Uh, so it says, in addition to CEOs, I seek out investment bankers who are most active in the industry and who know it deeply. I also talk to venture capital firms because they spend a lot of time looking at the big trends in different industries. I tap buy side institutions and successful fund managers who have battle scars from investing in that industry. Uh, industry vendors keeps going. Industry vendors are also a good source. They have a sense of the trends that could drive changes in the market. And finally, or not finally, there's two more, shareholder activists uh, often have important insights as well. And I reach out to journalists who know the industry because by nature, they're a skeptical bunch and I want to hear their perspectives. So then what he'll do is he runs through like short descriptions of how uh, to get the major trend right in a bunch of the, or how he did in a bunch of the businesses that he started. And, you know, this goes over 40 years. What's interesting is uh, the first one. So he talks about Amorex and Hamilton Resources. And it's about like his time in the oil industry. It reminded me of like, a very important idea that I think that it's that you see applied to a bunch of different industries. This idea that you can identify a market with valuable but hard to get data. And <laughs> my favorite application of this, because it's just so nuts, was uh, the episode I did on the, the billionaire art dealer, Larry Gagosian. Uh, episode 325 if you haven't if you haven't listened to that that episode it was fascinating because that's exactly what he did he identified a market with valuable but hard to get data and then essentially made him his uh, made uh like a personal treasure map that that his entire business uh rests upon so that came to mind when i was reading this section a little bit of luck put me in the oil industry in 1979 when i started my oil brokerage company emrex it was a highly profitable business and my realization was that a big trend was forming around the need to capture and share information more quickly. Remember, this is 1979 pre-internet. This whole section is nuts. Uh, so it says that was a trend that transformed the industry in the late 1980s. We made a lot of money by being the first oil broker to get ahead of the trend. At the time, there's no internet, no email, no centralized databases with easy global access. The main, so this is going to blow your mind. The main source of information about the price of oil was a newsletter that came in the mail. And so he talks about, he's like, listen, we're making verbal handshakes with clients in Europe and Asia for 50 and $75 million over the phone with nothing on paper for days. And so this next sentence is a description of the problem. The lack of timely information was a big problem for oil brokers. We made our money by matching buyers and sellers and taking a commission, just like Larry Gagosian. I could see that there was isolated pockets of valuable oil pricing data trapped all over the globe. And I knew that if we could figure out a better way to share that information, we can unlock a lot of value. And so there's no off-the-shelf solution. So he builds his own. I think this is something he does multiple times. And he says, essentially, they built like their own crude version of the internet. Um, but it allowed uh, us to do something revolutionary. Every time an Amorex employee learns something useful about a buyer or, seller act buyer or seller activity or the price of oil, they entered it into our database. Then we could share that information much more quickly with our brokers around the globe. That process took hours, not days, which was close to instantaneous back then in the 70s and 80s. So take something that took days, now it takes hours. We had created a way to obtain objective insights into global oil supply and demand and pricing trends. And then here is the trends that he identified when he set up United Waste Systems. Uh, the Red Bull episode that I did, uh, episode 333, I think. Uh, it's pretty wild that, you know, that business is going to make him, you know, his net worth between somewhere between like 20 and $40 million. He was paying himself before he died somewhere between $508 million a year. He identified the opportunity from reading a magazine article and I'm like, hey, uh, the richest guy in Japan, I think it was the country, makes these like energy tonics because there was no energy drink market at the time. That's interesting. And that cha that reading the article changed his life forever. Dietrich M Mischitz, I think is how you say his name. But we see Brad Jacobs coming up with an idea, too. He's just like, well, the idea from United Way Systems. This is fascinating. I remember vividly the moment the industry caught my attention. In 1989, I was reading Merrill Lynch research reports in bed on a lazy Sunday morning. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and came across a report written by the top-ranked analyst for environmental services then. The two largest companies in the waste industry at that time were each making about a half a billion dollars a year in profit. Remember, that's why I brought up the Red Bull guy. He's like, what? This guy is the high, the paying the most, he's making the most money in this entire country and he sells energy tonics. And then Brad sitting in bed reading research reports, right? And he's like, wait a minute, these guys are making half a billion dollars a year in profit in 1989. 
and I thought, how hard can it be to have trucks pick up trash, deposit in a safe place, and then send out an invoice? I wanted to know more. And so he identifies the two big trends at the time. Uh, landfill capacity was becoming pr uh, precious because regulations were pushing small trash dumps out of business. So that's trend number one. Trend number two, integration of hauling and disposal. This created an opportunity for end-to-end -end consolidation. I looked for a way to capitalize on both trends and found it in tech-based truck routing. So think about the entire oil industry kind of operating blind, waiting for this, <laughs> this letter in the mail to tell them the prices. He sees a very similar trend uh, or problem in the waste management business. Mom and pop owners were running trash collection companies by the seat of their pants and making money at it. Few companies were planning their truck routes methodically, much less using technology to do it. I think he says they use like a map and like push pins. It's like, this is, he's like, this is ridiculous. They did not focus on optimizing routes. And so he starts optimizing routes. And this is the result. Instead of sending 50 trucks out over five days to pick up X tons of waste, 20 trucks, so more, less than half, could now perform the same service in three days. So instead of 50 trucks in five days, he's doing the same work in, with 20 trucks in three days. Our costs kept coming down as our processes improved and our profit margin grew significantly. That is the company that he sells for $2.5 billion. Then he talks about where he gets his idea for his other company, United Rentals. Uh, I, was looking up to roll, I was looking to roll up another industry. And so I set up half day meetings with nine different groups of bankers and analysts at Merrill Lynch. One of those analysts asked if I thought about going into the construction equipment rental. So that's how he finds the idea for his next billion dollar company. And even though it's a different industry, he sees the same problem. This is the part that I texted to a bunch of friends because I absolutely love. While the rental industry overall was slow to computerize, the larger regional players were more tech savvy. By 1997, nearly all of them were running on software developed by a company called Win Systems. This is how to get God mode, what I wrote to myself. When I was a kid, I played a lot of video games and you'd use like cheat codes like Game Genie and stuff like that. Uh, and you could, one of the things that you would try to unlock is something that was referred to as God mode a lot, which essentially gives you like on, omnipresent uh, like view of the entire world and like what you want to do. You can think of what's happening here, this, this, this idea that I absolutely love that you did. He gets omnipresent data of his entire industry. It's almost like operating in God mode in video games when I was a kid. By 1987, nearly all of them, all the larger, larger players in this industry is in now, right, were running on software developed by a company called Win Systems. This told me that software was capable of managing hundreds of thousands of pieces of equipment flowing on and off job sites because they buy construction equipment and then they rent them out. It's very you know straightforward business. So what does he do? I bought Win Systems. He bought he bought the software that all of the main players were using. Owning Win accomplished two things. One, we had an industry best platform that we can continue to develop internally for our own use, and the acquisition gave us access to aggregated anonymized data on macro trends across, across the industry. This gave us a high-level view of emerging market trends, such as equipment gluts or shortages in the making. making. What does buying the software company allow him to do? We could now proactively adjust our pricing and asset management while the rest of the industry was being reactive. I'm going to repeat that. That is so important. We could proactively adjust our pricing and asset management while the rest of our, the industry, the rest of our competitors was being reactive. Okay, so then I love this story that comes from the chapter on how to do lots of high quality M&A uh, without imploding. And it reminds me of one of my favorite sayings that I bring up a lot, that opportunity is a strange beast and that it frequently appears after a loss. What can appear to be a terrible thing actually, be, uh, actually winds up being a blessing in disguise. And so he gives us some advice. He says, be sure to cover your flank. It's the stuff that comes out of left field that can take a deal down. In 2007, I sold United Rentals to the private equity firm Cerberus. No way I'm pronouncing that right. So this private equity firm buys it uh, for $7 billion, or at least that's what Brad thought happened. Highly satisfied that I just sold the company, I stepped down as chairman and wandered off to my private investment firm to begin planning my next venture. Then the great financial crisis arrived. Remember, this is 2007. A great financial crisis arrives. Private equity firms began welching on deals and Cerebus uh, defaulted on the United Rentals Agreement. As a result, our stock plunged 31% in 24 hours. Over the course of the following year, the stock fell to $5. 
we collected a $100 million breakup fee, decided not to seek another buyer, and eventually got things righted. Today, the market cap of United Rentals is $38 billion. So tried to sell it, thought they sold it for $7 billion in 2007. Fast forward, what, 15 years, something like that. Good, they, good thing they did not sell it for $7 million because the market cap is now $31 billion higher. The deals I've avoided have contributed more to my success than the deals I've done. And I love this advice. He talks about the importance of set, setting up uh, feedback loops. This is something that Brad's going to have in common with j- just the ones that come to the top of my mind. Les Schwab, Sam Walton of Walmart, and Jim Casey of UPS. They all prioritize this. And what is this? It's getting data from frontline employees. They want data from the people that are actually interacting with the customers. They all talk about it in their biographies and autobiographies over and over again. So he says, when we buy a company, we discover that the frontline employees, middle managers, and even some senior executives have never been asked, what would you do to improve the company? And this is insane. You would think that the owners would want to know that. And so what Les Schwab, Sam Walton, and Jim Casey would say about this, in Jim Casey's case, anytime he was driving, he'd see a UPS truck, he'd pull over or have his driver pull over and he'd talk to them. He'd want to know what's actually happening. They all make, they all say differently. But the, the, the idea behind it's the same. They're like, your executives, the team you have around you, like they, over time, they start to like filter information too much and they can give you like an overly rosy or like false, like positive view of what's actually happening in your company. And so the way you, you penetrate that, oh, Bezos did this too. I just remember he would uh, work, he has everybody in Amazon, including himself, would work uh, customer service, like in the call centers and actually answer calls directly from uh, customers. So anyways, uh, your executives and the people around you over time tend to give you like an overly like optimistic view of your company. And so one way to cut through that is like Sam Walton would go in stores and he'd talk to people, ch- uh, the cashiers, he'd talk to the people at the front door, he'd talk to the people unloading uh, the trucks. It's like, tell me what the hell's going on in this company. I want to know this. Like, what would you do to improve the company? Why are you not asking them that? Of course you should ask them that. To them, it was very uh, obvious. Uh, but like almost I, what I realized too is like, almost at the end of the book, he has another, uh, he has two questions that I thought were genius that I want to add in this section too, because I think it ties to what he's saying here. And so what he would do, it doesn't have to just be in a company you're acquiring too. It could be in your existing company. So he asks, I love these questions. He asks two questions. What's your single best idea to improve our company? What is your single best idea to improve our company? And what's the stupidest thing we're doing as a company? And so he would send that out company wide, you know, send an email. I would, you know, so you probably just send this an email one at a time to everybody in the company. Respond back to this email. What is your single best idea to improve our company? Right? Think of all the interesting data and ideas that, that uh, you could, could get. And then what's the stupidest thing we're doing as a company? I love this. I love these questions for business. And then I was actually thinking, it's actually good for a family too. Like I've talked about this before where, you know, I'm obsessed with what I'm doing. I work seven days a week. Uh, you know, if you're listening to this, you're highly likely you're an obsessive person as well. And yet I don't want, I'm also a dad. So like, I'm not going to be a shit dad. Like, that's just not an option for me. And so <laughs> it sounds weird that this came to mind, but uh, my son's too young for this, but my daughter's not. And so like, I solicit feedback from, <laughs> from her. I think I've told you this before, uh, but I will literally go, you know, I'm not like, I was just like, Hey, like, how am I doing as a dad? Like, am I like, and I ask questions like this, like, what's the, like, when do I feel, I forgot who told me to do this. Like, I asked her, uh, and I'll text her this too, because she's old enough to text, which is funny. Like, what do I do that makes you feel the most special? Uh, like, what don't you like that I'm doing? Or like, just how I'm doing. But this idea is almost basically like, I think it's a good idea in the business, but also the idea is like, what's your, or your single best idea to improve our family is another way to think about that, right? Instead of what's your single best idea to improve our company? What's the stupidest thing that we're doing as a family? What's the stupidest thing that I'm doing as a dad? What's your single best idea to improve what I'm doing as your father? I love the simplicity of it. And I love the idea of like sending it out because you could bury. The problem is like what I like about the idea of sending it out as a, uh, like an individual question, right? That just cuts right to the simplicity as opposed to putting it in, you know, maybe like a survey where there's like 10 or 12 other questions in there. I think those questions are so powerful that they're good enough to stand on their own. Um, so I absolutely love that idea. And again, so what's the feedback from from this is just good intel. Like, why wouldn't you do that? So one thing that pops up over and over again that's really important is you just, it's like, 
I have so many notes in the book. It's like, damn, this guy's moving fast. And then they're like, there's speed. Oh, there's more speed. It just happens over and over again. And so I mentioned this earlier, this hilarious story where his main competitor, the CEO of uh, Hertz, which was the largest, uh, not only did they have the, the like rental car company, but they're the, the, at the time they were the, the largest uh, equipment rental chain uh, in the country as well. And Brad has this great line here. He's like, yeah, it, uh, Hertz did this and they built up a national equipment rental chain to about a billion dollars of annual revenue over the course of 37 years. United Rentals did that in 13 months. And so he gets this invitation, come have lunch with the CEO. And he's like, oh, maybe he's like trying to buy me out. Like what's happening? Let's just, let me go over there and see what's up. And it was ridiculous. And the, the, the note I left myself was a losing strategy. Take your competitor out to lunch and ask him to slow down. And essentially that's what he did. He's like, you know, you made me change one of my taglines. I had the largest car rental company and the largest equipment rental company in the world. And now I've got the largest car rental company and the second largest equipment rental company. I don't want to be second in anything. And he's telling him to slow down. You're making a mess of this industry. You're going too fast. You're going to mess this up. And fast forward uh, several years and their United Rentals is making like six times the amount of money. <laughs> so uh, that is a losing strategy. Do not take your competitor out to lunch and be like, please slow down. Please be nicer to me. No, foot on the gas and foot on their neck. I want to go back to the maxims that are in the acknowledgement um, because the thing about maxims is they're not hard rules and you need to know when to break the rules. And so he has this idea that you should lose perfectionism. And so, but there's one domain where you don't want to actually lose perfectionism and that is in hiring. The most important thing a CEO does is recruit great people. Yes. I made the point that aiming for perfection can be counterproductive. Good is usually good enough. But if you're going to break that rule, you break it for people. Make your hiring choices as perfect as they can be because there are few mistakes costlier than hiring the wrong person. This is so good. Way to, way to remember this. An empty seat is less damaging than a poor fit. Make your hiring choices as perfect as they can be because there are few mistakes costlier than hiring the wrong person. An empty seat is less damaging than a poor fit. This entire section is about the difference between super talented people and what they bring uh, to your company. So I love this. Um, I'm going to read. Steve Jobs was, was asked one time, uh, what talent do you think you consistently brought to Apple? This is his answer. Uh, this was his answer, rather. And I'm going to read it to you first because I think it sets up what, what Brad's trying to teach us right here. He says, I think I've consistently figured out who the really smart people were to hang around with. You must find extraordinary people. The key observation is that in most things in life, the dynamic range between the average quality and best quality is at most two to one. Pick anything. It's going to be basically two to one, right? But in the field that I was interested in, I noticed that the dynamic range between what an average person could accomplish and what the best person could accomplish was 50 or 100 to one. Given that, you're well advised to go after the cream of the cream. You can build a team that pursues the A-plus players. A small team of A players can run circles around a giant team of B and C players. So then he's going to talk about how to build outrageously talented team and what he feels is most valuable. Remember, Steve Jobs said, hey, I think one of the best things I did was I figured out who the really smart people were. I hung around them, tried to hire them, and built incredibly outrageously talented teams. Brad says, screening for superior, superior intelligence eliminates 90% of all candidates. So that's the first thing I look for. There's just no substitute for smarts. There's no substitute for brains. The CEO trait most closely correlated with organizational success is a high IQ. Double down on hiring the, bri the brightest. When he is interviewing people, he will ask himself, can this person think dialectically? I'm going to define that for us because I love this de definition of dialectically. De the ability to think dialectically is the ability to view issues from multiple perspectives and to arrive at the most economical and reasonable reconciliation of seemingly contradictory information. That's so important. The ability to view issues from multiple perspectives and to arrive at the most economical and reasonable reconciliation of seemingly contradictual, contradictory information. Can this person think dialectically? That is, are they capable of thinking from multiple perspectives and reconciling streams of information that seem to flow in different directions? And second, second question, are they capable of changing their opinion, 
rigid thinkers at any level of intelligence are less valuable because they are mired in their own points of view. More advice. You should hire ambitious people who want to accomplish big things and make a lot of money. More advice. It is better to be slightly understaffed. I find that slightly understaffed teams are more focused and spend less time doing redundant busy work. Brad is big on vibes. I think he calls it the love vibe. And he says, my team and I spend a lot of time together. So it's a big deal that we like one another. An organization is like a party. You only want to invite people who bring the vibe up. And so he talks about, listen, man, I have advice for you. This is how you're going to differentiate between the A, B, and C players on your team. His whole thing is like, you cannot have C players ever. And when you figure out B players, it's inevitable that you're going to have some, but you can't have C players. And his whole point uh, is that if you, if you hire B players, they're likely to hire C players. So you got to be very careful with the B players too. But uh, as a, uh, organization scales, you can't have all A players. This is something Steve Jobs said that Pixar, when he had 400, 400 employees, it's the first team of all A players that he ever saw in his life. And he said, you know, at Apple, I think that time had 3,000 uh, people. And he's like, it's impossible to have a team, have a company with uh, 3,000 A players. So, of course, you're going to have some B players. But you got to be careful because they love hiring C players and C players suck. This is how you differentiate between A, B, and C players. And he does this in his mind. Again, thought experiment. Uh, I, might, I imagine this person coming into my office and quitting without warning. Uh, just by imagining this scenario, I can immediately tell from my own inner response whether this person is an A, B, or C player. If my first thought is, I was going to fire this person sooner or later, so it's no big deal, that's a C player. If my reaction is, I don't like this, but I can live with it, the transition period might be a little bumpy, but we'll find somebody else, maybe even somebody better. We are talking about a B player. But if my reaction is an internal dialogue of panic, and it sounds like we're so screwed, how did we get into this situation? There's no way we're going to find somebody as fantastic as this person. That is an A player. And what do you do with A players? You overpay the hell out of them. Because here's the thing. The reason you should overpay them is because you, the reason you overpay for talent is because it's nearly impossible to overpay for talent. Think about what Steve Jobs said earlier, right? In, in some fields, the, 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 the best person is not twice as good. They're a hundred times as good. Think about when Steve Jobs came back to Apple. Apple bought Next for almost a half a billion dollars, right? The way to think about that is Apple paid half a billion dollars to rehire Steve Jobs and they got the deal of the century. It is almost impossible to overpay for talent. And Brad talks about there's a lot of things that motivate people, but you, you're silly if you don't think compensation. Yeah, they have to believe in the mission. They have to like the w what work to do. They have to find it intellectually challenging. They have to like their team. They also should be paid oodles and oodles of money. So he says there's 174,000 employees uh, out of all the three companies that he currently chairs. Not a single one of them shows up for work because they want to make money for Brad Jacobs. They come because they want to make money for themselves and their families. Money animates people everywhere. So he's talking about, it's like, I have employees all over the world. This is not just a United States thing. Money animates people everywhere. That's why I've overpaid, quote unquote, almost every direct report I've ever had to ensure I had top team people in place. Overpay for talent. It is nearly impossible to overpay for talent. That's such an important thing to remember. Never, ever, ever forget the dynamic range of humans. It makes no financial sense to skimp on salary incentives to save $100,000 a year when hiring a second best candidate may cost you millions of dollars in lost profit. Oh, this guy's good. He's an A player. Let me, I can save money. I hate when people try to, like, obviously a huge, what's, what's the two biggest themes in the history of entrepreneurship, right? Focus and watch your costs. That's repeated over and over again by, all, by the vast majority of the people you and I study. Watching your costs does not count when you're doing talent. That's not, it's like, oh, I have a great A player, but I can hire the, uh, for the same job, I can hire a B player, play, player for $100,000 less. No, that's not $100,000 less. You lost millions, millions. And in Steve Jobs' case, if they didn't hire him, what if they said, they didn't offer him, I think, what was it, 470? What was that deal? 470 million, something like that? They said, and said no, no, it's only going to be 200 million or whatever it is. They try to shortchange him by a couple hundred million. He doesn't come back to Apple. What's, Apple's probably out of business. Apple probably doesn't exist to this day. Never, ever, ever forget the dynamic range of human beings and overpay for talent because it's nearly impossible to overpay for talent. And then I want to close on what I feel is almost like a manifesto that it's an incredible honor and a good thing for the world to 
build products and services that make other people's lives better, to create jobs for hundreds of thousands of people in Brad Jacobs' case, to create wealth for your shareholders. Um, and really is a testament to the all-important entrepreneurial spirit. I love being a CEO. There's a joy in creating value and an even greater joy in knowing that so many people beyond our organization are benefiting from our accomplishments. The best way to perform our duty is to fill an unmet need in the economy with a strong business model and a responsible organization. We create a healthy workplace environment for our people and we pay them well. We pamper our customers and we approach challenges with practical optimism that open our minds to solutions. The great majority of the tens of billions of dollars of value that my teams and I have created have flowed outside of my companies. I am extremely proud that our company could be counted on to create value. This is only possible because we operate in free markets where creating prosperity is a virtue. I want to share a personal experience I had with a small business owner whose work ethic and customer focus echo the value system that I instill in my own companies. The small business owner, his name is Steve. Steve handles the HVAC system at my home. Steve had originally worked for the large HVAC company that had installed the system, but that company was sold and Steve decided to set out on his own. So again, the all-important entrepreneurial spirit. Steve is a hardworking, take pride in your work entrepreneur who puts his customers first. He cares a great deal about doing his job the way it should be done. He told me his self-esteem goes up and down with his customer satisfaction scores. Naturally, he also measures his worth by how much money he's making to support his family. There's a fair amount of criticism being voiced about profit-seeking these days. Some people are embarrassed to talk about the importance of money, but Steve is totally comfortable with it. And in his pursuit of happy customers and a good living for his family, he built a successful business. As a result, customers flock to him. Steve is the face of the entrepreneurial spirit. I wrote this book with people like him in mind. People who want to work their tails off, who want to outsmart the competition, who want to put their customers on a pedestal, and who want to make a lot of money for their families. The summer after eighth grade, I attended the Rhode Island Governor's School for the Gifted in Art and Music, a summer enrichment program for kids who'd been nominated by their schools. I wasn't sure what to expect. On the first night, I was captivated by a speech given by one of the leaders. I remember goosebumps rising on my arms as he spoke. This program is a special opportunity, but it's up to you to take advantage of it, he said. You have a choice. You can waste the next couple months and not accomplish much, or you can go all in. This is an opportunity to go deep on a project and do the best work that you've ever done, but you have to decide if you want it, he said. It was there that I learned what it meant to go all in, that magical connection between intensity of focus and the end result. If I put my whole heart and soul into a project, I had it in me to create really cool stuff. We have it in our own hands to either make life meaningful or just pass time until we die. That's up to us. I hope you're inspired to run hard at making a few billion dollars or achieving some other big dream, and I wish you the exhilaration of seeing it through to success. And that is where I'll leave it. Highly, highly, highly recommend buying the book. As I said before, I really do think it's a reference. I'd read it through all the way. Uh, I read it all the way through and then keep it close at hand as a reference. The appendix uh, has a bunch of thought experiments. There's this really interesting history of technology timeline because that's a huge influence in the way Brad approaches his business. He calls it the mega trend in the universe. He's got interview questions for job candidates, recommended books. Uh, how to conduct meetings. The appendix is like full of, uh, you could buy the book just for the appendix, obviously read the whole thing. But anyways, if you buy the book using the link that is in the show notes, you'll be supporting the podcast at the same time. That is where I'm at, 300, 335 books down, 1,000 to go. And I'll talk to you again soon. It was fascinating in Brad's story, how many times, if you just listen, uh, that products or opportunities will be pulled out of you. Like if you think about him, sitting in bed reading analyst reports, realizing, hey, maybe this waste management company, uh, this waste management industry is a good, it could be a good opportunity or meeting with the, those analysts and getting an idea to enter into a new industry. The same thing um, has been happening to me. So I want to give you an update real quick on two things uh, before you go. One is Founders Only. Founders Only is 
the first ever in-person, I'm calling it a conference, uh, that's taking place in Austin, Texas on March 12th to the 14th, really is uh, a way for founders to build in-person relationships with other founders. That is the purpose, that is the, the North Star that is the mission of the event. It's limited to 150 people. You can apply by going to foundersonly.com. That's founders with an S, foundersonly.com. That link will obviously be in the show notes as well. So if you've already applied and haven't heard back, I'm first of all, there's way more. The reason I started this was saying that if you just listen, uh, you'll find opportunities. Because for years, people have been asking for ways to connect with other founders, especially other founders that listen to founders. And so that that product was kind of, pulled out of me. And so as a result, the demand has been higher than I anticipated, I guess. And it's taken me a while. Like I, I just have a lot of applications to go through. So if you have already applied, you don't have to reapply. I'm going through them. I promise you will hear back from me. Um, if you haven't yet applied, even though there's more, way more applications than there are slots, go and apply if you're interested to meet, to come to these in-person events these in-person conferences and build relationships. Something that comes up on the podcast over and over again is relationships run the world. A single relationship can be life-changing. Brad Jacobs just talked about the relationship that he built with Mr. Jesselson and that he had a bunch of business mentors and a bunch of relationships throughout business. Some are obviously going to be more important than others, but one can literally change your life. And so that is what I'm trying to, to do because this has happened in my life because of the podcast, because so many founders listen to founders. The, the network I have, the relationships, the friendships I've built, like the before and after of my life, it's just not comparable at all. Um, and so maybe the most, the most valuable asset I have isn't even something that you can put a price on or that you could buy. And the most valuable asset I have by far is my network. It's the friendships and the relationships that I've built and they all came from the podcast. And so I'm in a u- unique position, I feel, to be able to connect other people that have the same interests so the reason I would say is even though there's way more people on the list than I can than we can do for the than I can do for the first time is if you're interested in doing this go and apply um, and then what I'll be able to do is like figure out okay where does everybody live where can I do other events like I'm gonna like this gives me the ability to really figure out it's like how many people want to do this and then I can immediately put my my events team I have a world class events team behind me I'm using the same people. Uh, that plan capital camp. So if you ever go on a capital camp, you know, uh, you know, that that's a uh, once a year event, it's, you know, one of the highest end investor conferences in the country, there's a massive demand, usually there's, you know, 10, 10 x the amount of people that want to go uh, to that, then can actually they can actually fit. So they've been doing this for many years there, I've gone to it, it's a world class event. So I was like, Oh, I'm going to use these same people. And so that's who's uh, helping me not only do all logistics, the planning, but also helping me go through and really figure out, okay, if there's, I may be vastly underestimating, the point I'm telling you this, and I know I'm rambling, the, I may be vastly underestimating the demand here, and I shouldn't have because people have been asking me this for years. So it's really important. The, the sooner you get in on the list, the sooner you put in your application, the higher priority you have for future events. And you can kind of help me figure out, okay, this is the map. This is where everybody's at. And I'm willing to travel, you know, anywhere. I don't live in Austin. I'm just going to Austin because the venue where I'm hosting the first founders only event. I spent a few days there at this other event uh, last year. Um, and I thought it was incredible. I was like, this is perfect. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, at least I've, I've spent a few days here. I liked it. I enjoyed it. It makes perfect sense for what I'm trying to do, what my old overall mission is. I should just, the first one should just do, uh, should just be here. And so I'm going to be doing these, yeah, assuming they're successful, assuming I, I'm, you know, good at doing this, uh, which, you know, I can learn, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing this every year, there's people coming in already. This is insane. And I really do appreciate it. Uh, there's people flying in from all over the world already for the first founders only event. That's insane. Main point here is apply as soon as you can. It's helpful for you because you'll have priority for either future events or maybe even this one. And it really helps me understand like where I should be doing these in the future. So foundersonly.com, foundersonly.com. That's the place to do that. Again, I think it's a no brainer. Uh, relationships around the world, uh, meeting another founder, Another, another person that is interested in the same things as you're doing, these driven A players, uh, the relationship between these two people, they produce nonlinear returns. So I think this is something that you should prioritize and something I'm definitely prioritizing. Not only have, have I been for the past few years, but definitely even more so moving forward. Okay, so that's that. Foundersonly.com, 
foundersonly.com. The second thing is foundersnotes.com. Founders with an S, foundersnotes.com. This is another example of how just listening, paying attention to what's going on around you, uh, you're going to find opportunity and ways to serve other people. So people for years, for years, this is the most common request. So like, I want access to all your notes. You're kind of this psychopathically obsessed person sitting in the room documenting the history of entrepreneurship for now eight years. Uh, you have all these ways to tie these ideas together. How the hell did you do that? People think I have a good memory. I promise you I don't. It's because I have what at the time was uh, what I said over and over again is the, the most valuable app that I've ever paid for, which is Readwise. And all Readwise allowed me to do is like store all of my notes and highlights for all the books I, I read, right? So I have a history and I can go back and search them and what it allows me is like, you know, let's say I have a couple, I think I, there's 280 books in there right now and I still have more I have to enter. I can go and search any term, anything that I'm thinking about. Uh, so if you sign up for foundersnotes.com, once you sign up, once you'll get a, a welcome email from me and it explains in detail how I use the product. So use that as a reference. And the second thing, it's gonna drop you on this page and the page, you're gonna have a bunch of options. The first one is search highlights in this big box at the top and that's, you know, very, self-explanatory anything that you're thinking about a person a place something that you need in your business hiring recruiting talent we talked a lot about that in the brad jacobs episode in fact brad the, the highlight let me give you an example the highlights from the brad jacobs uh book are already in founders notes they're they're, they're waiting for you to explore so the search highlights i use all the time i use, it's in the browser this is uh right now it's only available on the web so just keep the browser open or keep the tab open in your browser, eventually it's going to be in an app. Uh, you just gotta give me some time to, to work through everything. I'm still testing it, making sure everything's uh, functioning as I want it to function, so we're making improvements all the time. So keep the tab open in your browser, search it for anything that comes to mind, okay? The next thing I do, this is, I think, the searching is invaluable to me. I could not make the podcast without it. I use it in conversations with friends or founders when we're trying to figure out problems they may have. And the way to like essentially on demand tap into the collective knowledge of history's greatest entrepreneurs is what I'm trying to do. And it will keep improving. So if you think about it now, if you invest in a subscription today, by next year, there'll be another 50 books in there. There's probably another, I don't know, 4,000 highlights or something like that. More connections to be made, more notes to be made. So the product improves every single day. Uh, you can also, also just go by books if you tap on books. And then obviously what I would do, I think I mentioned in that episode that you just listened to, it's like, you know, go and find Danny Meyer's book and just read through all the highlights. It takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, probably less than that. If you're really focused, um, I just clicked on books, like how to make a few billion dollars is there. My highlights from Oprah, uh, the Bugatti uh, book that is impossible to find. There's 59 highlights there. You could probably read that in 15 minutes and have a good idea and remind yourself of like what was important to the founder of Bugatti, Napoleon, Tiger Woods, Ted Turner, Charlie Munger, Christian Dior, over and over again. So what I would do is when you have extra time and you want to read something, instead of wasting time scrolling social media, go and read the highlights of a book. Now, the I think the most valuable feature, and I hate to say this because the search feature is, search feature is probably the most valuable feature, but the feature that is like really interesting to me and the one I use a lot is the highlight feed because the highlight feed is... Think about it, um, my friend Morgan Housel, the best-selling author. His book, Psychology of Money, has sold like 4 million copies. It's crazy. Um, I talk to him all the time. He's a massive fan of founders. Uh, he called, he said, he heard me say this on a podcast one time, that I think the highlight feed is a smart Twitter feed. And so he's like, that's exactly, and he starts using it, and he's like, that's exactly what it is. And so I just clicked on the highlight feed. And what it does is instead of reading, think about when you go on any social media, right? It's just like random collection of either posts if it's in text if it's like you know twitter uh random collection of videos if it's you know reels or tiktok well the highlight feed is random highlights presented to you from all the books that i've ever covered and if you can train yourself now i i, I need to back up i built this product for people already running successful companies right that's uh, I think you already know this, you probably obviously, but Founders has the most valuable entrepreneur audience in the world. If you knew who was listening to this and who I get to interact with and talk to, it would blow your mind. So those are the people that are going to get the most value from this because they already have existing successful businesses and empires where if they read one thing, they can apply that lesson immediately, just like Brad Jacobs. 
I mean, he already had a lot of success, so he's reading that analyst report in his bed in London. <laughs> he already has the resources to act on that idea, right? If when he goes to have that meeting with Merrill Lynch, he has the resources to act on that idea. So this is not, people are always like, can I get a free trial? The podcast is the free trial. If you're not in a position where you don't, you're not already running a successful, a successful business, do not sign up for Founders Notes. Don't. Listen to the podcast, get yourself into a position, use the lessons to build, to get your business into a position where it makes perfect sense. It's like a no brainer. Of course, I would subscribe to this. I would invest in subscription because I could read it for 40 years and only, you only need one idea. Think about what Charlie Munger said. You know, he read Barron's for 50 years and made $400 million. He's like, I found one idea that I can act on in Barron's magazine. He acted on it because he had the resources to do so. He turned that, I think he made $80 million from that one idea that he got in Barron's Magazine and then gave that $80 million to Lee Lu. And Lee Lu, one of his favorite investors, turned that $80 million into $400 million. And it was like, oh, this is, if Charlie Munger was alive, right, and his eyesight was better, he would be using this because it's such a giant, like, of course you would do this. So the highlights fee, and then I'm going to wrap this up because I don't want to belabor this point too much. The highlights feed, I really feel, is magic. And that is why I'm so so um, adamant. Like, we have a bunch of ideas on the product roadmap. The, f- the first one we're doing next is the Founders GPT. So you'll be able to, like, query um, and, like, you know, use the chat interface. But after that, it's got to be the app. Because you can read Founder the, the highlight feed in the browser. And I'm doing that right now. And I do it all the time. Because um, I have this big-ass iMac that I like to, to use. But I also love it on the go. And it's just perfect as an app. You know, anytime I'm stuck at a light, so I'm waiting for, you know, I'm meeting somebody for lunch and they're running late or I'm at a doctor's office, whatever. But getting in the habit of just reading the highlights feed, I really think that's like the killer feature here. Um, because it's just, again, it's almost like history's greatest entrepreneurs talking to you, speaking to you. Like most of these highlights are like tweet sized. So you can read it. Some of them don't apply at all. You're like, okay, move on to the next one. Just like if you're reading any random, you know, anything online. Now, that doesn't apply to me. That's not helpful. Okay, move on. But get in the habit of spending time with this. And then once you do that, you want to be constantly reminded of these lessons because now you have a way to actually apply them. And so you could take knowledge and turn it into profit. And so that if that is you and you're in a position to take knowledge and turn it into a profit, then I would heavily, uh, I would heavily advise you to invest in a subscription to Founders Notes and you can do that at foundersnotes.com. I've already been speaking uh, a ton. I got to work on, I got to go reading, uh, read and work on the next episode. The next episode, I'll give you a sneak peek. So this episode was how to make a few billion dollars. The next episode is going to be how to lose a few billion dollars. The rise and fall of a billionaire utility tycoon is coming next week. Thank you very much for your support. I hope you do an application for Founders Only. I hope you come to one of these events. And I hope... Uh, Assuming you're in the right position, I hope you invest in a subscription to foundersnotes.com. I will talk to you again soon.